Hello, and thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy Center and Yahoo Finance for today's conversation about student loan debt in the COVID-19 era. My name is Mariette Aborn. I am a research analyst at BTC, and we partnered with Yahoo Finance to bring you a series of conversations leading up to the November election focused on the most critical policy issues facing our nation. True to name, we've brought together a range of perspectives for a productive discussion that will tackle these important issues head on. Today's conversation, the third in our series, will focus on student loan debt and how to support borrowers. The economic fallout from COVID-19 has amplified the financial burden of student loan debt, which is the second highest consumer debt category behind only mortgages, with 43 million borrowers owing more than $1.5 trillion. While interest and payments on student loans have been suspended since the start of the crisis, this pause has renewed debate about how to best support borrowers moving forward. Some feel that debt cancellation is needed to correct the failings of the student loan system and to promote equity, while others argue that there are better and less costly ways to target support to struggling borrowers. As we look toward an economic recovery, addressing the burden of student loan debt will be a key issue for the next administration. And with that, let me turn it over to today's moderator, Jennifer Rogers of Yahoo Finance. Jennifer, take it away. A big thank you to you, Marriott, and also the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, student loans are a major campaign issue this election as Americans graduate from college with heavier burdens. As Marriott just laid out uh, the crisis that we are really facing here, I want to bring in our panelists to discuss what the government should be doing for students and families or proposals on both sides of the aisle, and hopefully some common ground that we're going to be able to find here today as well. So Tiffany Jones is a senior director of High Higher Education Policy at the Education Trust, a group headed up by John King, who served in President Barack Obama's cabinet as the 10th Secretary of Education. And Tom Leppert was the mayor of Dallas from 2007 to 2011. He ran for the U.S. Senate in 2012 as a Republican. And after that, he stepped away from electoral politics to lead Kaplan, the education services company. So Tiffany, I want to start with you. And before we go forward and looking about what's going to happen in the next four years, let's just talk about what's happened this year with the suspension and the debt relief that we have had right now. What do you think the impact has been of uh, suspending interest and in payments on student loans this year? Yeah, absolutely. So it was exciting to see that Congress thought student debt was enough of an issue to include it in part of the, the recovery plan for COVID-19 pandemic and the economic implications uh, as well. And so that meant that some federal student loan borrowers, uh, including myself, were able to have their payments suspended for uh, a few months during uh, this time of crisis. And that uh, suspension has been extended a couple of times now. Um, and again, as you noted, uh, what also makes that great is that the interest rates, uh, you know, the interest accumulation was suspended as well. And those who were in particular repayment plans also had the opportunity to have the government continue uh, making those payments on their behalf so that they would still be on schedule in terms of giving their loans forgiven. I think uh, there's some challenges as well. There are federal student loan borrowers who are not uh, a part of the group of students who are able to benefit. So those who had Perkins loans um, and uh, FES, FEEL loans, and that, that group accumulated to be about 8 million students. So this is a big deal. Um, not to mention this private loans had nothing to do with it. If you're a student and you owed private loans, uh, it was up to your servicers to make determinations around how they were going to deal with the impending uh, pandemic. And some of the stories from students are that there's still an expectation that they're able to repay their loans. Um, and just one other note, uh, in this moment, of course, uh, unemployment has risen and there's a pending economic crisis. And so it makes uh, it very challenging for students to have to make decisions between uh, food and housing and whether or not to uh, pay towards their student loans. Um, so although the temporary suspension was helpful, this is a much bigger and longer term problem that will require a lot more work. So, Tom, as we've seen with uh, the labor market numbers recently, just a, a, a slowdown in the um, the recovery that we have here, uh, given the coronavirus uh, recession. So what do you think 
will happen if the current suspension by executive order ends on December 31st, if payments were to resume as usual on January 1st, what do you think the consequences would be for borrowers in the federal student loan system? Well, I think as you and Tiffany, Tiffany appropriately point out, there's a lot of people in our economy and our nation that are hurting right now. And clearly this action of suspending the interest in the payments has helped a lot of people. But unfortunately, like a lot of federal programs, it was politically expedient, but not particularly effective in terms of targeting the resources. We have a situation where, again, as Tiffany said, there's a lot of people that are hurting this help them. But the reality of it is that most people on the student loan program are graduates of colleges would be in the bracket that would need, need it the least. They would be the highest educated. They've been the least affected, a lot of information based, so they maintain their jobs. So unfortunately, they've gotten a benefit, but they didn't need it. There's a lot of people that didn't need it, as Tiffany pointed out, that haven't gotten the benefit. So while this helped a small group, because again, the unemployment rate is somewhere less than a quarter of the population, a lot of people got it, that other three quarters that didn't need it, as opposed to directing resources where they really need it, to some of the other areas that Tiffany mentioned, but also to some people that probably need benefits and help from an employment standpoint that go far beyond the need for just paying back student loans. So uh, that said, in terms of people that have decided not to pay uh, back their loans, I mean, I think the vast majority of people have taken a pause here because um, w whatever reason they decided to do it, they thought it was helping them there. So are you advocating that we need to reach a broader impact of people with debt uh, relief here? Uh, how, how would you uh, suggest that we reach those places that we're not getting right now? I would hope that what we would use is this is really a platform to address the student loan program in total and make some changes that are that are that are crucial to, to it. Like a lot of programs, we threw a lot of federal money, which really increased the cost of education, which is at the core of the problem. Unfortunately, with all the federal money that came in, we lost any sense of cost. Institutions increased their costs. We've seen in the last two decades after inflation for a four year institution. It's 75% more expensive today than it was. We've thrown in a lot of costs because nobody was concerned with the pricing because of all this federal money. So we've seen overheads increase substantially. I know the school I went to where there was one or two deans, there's probably 50 deans right now. Uh, that hasn't gone to the faculty, it's gone to an overhead standpoint. There's been a lot of costs that have gone into non-educational type of things, ranging from football teams to rock climbing walls, those sorts of things that really aren't at the core of educating the people, especially the people that need it. And we've also seen a shift in the learner. It's gone from a traditional of go out of high school, go into a four-year institution, to a lot of adult learners. And a lot of those programs haven't really addressed their needs, either the institutions or these programs. So what I'd hope we do is use a platform that would take the, the dollars and put them to those that are needed. Uh, reinforce the Pell programs, which are for need, uh, put more transparency and also hold institutions accountable. The outcomes of a lot of institutions have been poor, and that has increased the debt for a lot of students that simply didn't produce the college degree that would give them the benefit. Remember, if you get a college degree, it's worth about a million dollars over your lifetime. But if you don't finish, then it becomes a problem. There's a lot of institutions that don't have good outcomes. We need to hold them accountable. So, uh, Tiffany, I mean, there's there is a lot to unpack in the education system. Big changes that that Tom's talking about there in the cost structure, but right now we have you know 1.68 million trillion. Look, I mean, such big numbers out there <laughs> that has already been borrowed. There are people that are excited and hopeful that debt could be canceled. And this has become uh, you know, a political and an election talking point right now, that basically we have these temporary payment suspensions. Do you think that this could be a vehicle for longer term actual forgiveness? It's hard to say, you know, what Congress will do. I, I can speak from the perspective of, you know, what I'm seeing in the conversation among education uh, advocates. And many are arguing, you know, prior and asked for debt cancellation prior to COVID-19 for a number of reasons. One in which, 
you know, the college degree and having access to higher education is more important than ever, even as it's become less affordable. Um, part of the reason it's become less affordable it is related to states investing less over time in higher ed in the last recession. Uh, States, you know, one of the, the first places they cut their budgets that is related to higher education. Um, and in many cases, colleges increase their prices and saddle students and families with debt. Um, and so that was a, a policymakers were a factor in creating some of these problems. So I think that's worth acknowledging why policy solutions are part of the equation and not just talking about individual student choice uh, and families. Um, I think some of the concern about canceling debt is are some of the issues Tom raised around equity. Who would benefit? Would it uh, go to reinforce inequity by uh, students who have graduate degrees or professional degrees getting some of this loan cancellation? And I think one of the reasons why the issue has persisted anyway and gained support among equity advocates is because within those groups, what groups that might seem privileged on the surface still really struggle with debt. And so in some of the research done at the Education Trust, black students, for example, who come from privileged households, high income, six-figure households, go to school, full to high school, to four-year colleges. That's a privileged group, complete college. One in three default on their student loans. And some of that has to do with the racial wealth gap, the fact that white families have 10 times the wealth of black families due to the legacy of slavery and discrimination in this country. And so they're careful to say, well, people with college degrees don't need help with their debt or students from this particular income cut off, they may not need help managing their debt as well. Um, it, it's important to keep that into context that there are many students, again, on the surface that some might perceive as being privileged and not needing assistance, um, really do struggle to repay their loans and would require some help. Um, and so, again, many advocates are hoping that these conversations do translate into long-term, uh, larger, bolder solutions for, for students who are struggling. Tiffany, do you think that some of those bolder solutions could be around the income driven repayment? Does that get to any of the equity issues at all? Yes, uh, yes, in the short term, no, in the long term. So what I mean by that is um, it, some income driven repayment plans, if you have success navigating the system, the very confusing system that exists with so many different repayment plans and challenges that students have experienced with servicers, if you overcome those obstacles and you get into a repayment plan that allows your monthly payments to be appropriate and relative to your actual income, that can be helpful and that can be a relief. Um, the challenge is what happens over the long term, which is students making payments every single month that they're required to make, never missing a payment and watching their balances grow and grow and grow over time. Um, and also what that existing debt, the impact it has on their ability to navigate, uh, you know, purchasing a home or a uh, even, um, you know, purchasing a car or some of these other types of necessities that uh, can be rather challenging uh, when you already have such a large uh, pot of existing debt that many believe that they'll never be able um, to repay. So Tom, Tiffany talking about for the students kind of getting their their lives going, buying a home, buying a car. But we also know that for parents, this is a big issue. Uh, they've taken out millions of dollars in debt as well. Uh, billions. What do you do for those families? It's not, as you, as you said, it's, it's really hard because it's, it's federal, it's private, it's students, but it's also these parents as well. Do you think that there is a, a, a way to solve this for all these stakeholders? Yeah. Again, I, I, I share Tiffany's view that there are objectives should be improving accessibility to colleges, especially for low income students, and especially for first gener generation students. When you cancel debt across the board, though, you've got equity questions. How about the people that have already paid off their loans? How about the people that will come in the future with loans? All of those things need to be part of the con conversation and again, the taxpayer in terms of having fun funded this. I think the parents, as you point out, and that's roughly about $100 billion uh, relative to the student debt of about $1.6 trillion. So not a large percentage, but for a lot of those families, it makes a difference. That program, unfortunately, is riddled with an awful lot of issues, too. There's little underwriting standards. So in a lot of cases, parents have taken out loans that really didn't understand the implications of what they, 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 were, they were taking out. Again, I think the key there is looking forward and trying to address those. Again, I think the best thing to do from, our, from my perspective would be to put those loans back to the student in the sense of in the future, 
get rid of the student loan, the, the parent loans, which are the underwriting is very poor, and provide additional dollars, uh, supplementing state funds, as Tiffany uh, pointed out. The states have reduced it. Give them an incentive. Give them incentive to put some of their state dollars back into education that, that they've taken out. So you could have a matching federal program. Bipartisan Policy Center worked uh, over the course of the last year and a half or so, and that was one of the, the key findings, was finding an incentive to, 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 to be able to do that. I also do think that the income driven uh, would be a way to address it. Uh, Tiffany pointed out that there are an awful lot of income driven programs. It is really confusing to see exactly what the programs are out there. This would be a great opportunity, I think, to use this as a springboard to have one program, make it a simple program, and by default, put everybody on it. Again, it would be a needs based. Those that have the biggest need would get the biggest benefit. Those that have the highest salaries, highest incomes, et cetera, that don't need the taxpayer dollars, they again have an obligation and they would pay that back based on their income. And that proves to be a terrific investment for the taxpayer too. Tiffany, I just, can you re respond to that? Because it sounded like, you know, you there is some, the idea of the states getting involved here. Um, it, it, does that seem like a pragmatic way to go about it? I think absolutely. Uh, I think Tom raised the issue earlier of like, what happens to folks who've already paid? What about borrowers in the future? And I think one way is to tackle existing debt and have a clear plan for making college more affordable simultaneously. And one of the best ideas, again, that's been floating is a, a state and federal partnership where states and the federal government team up to invest in higher education. Part of that is um, making sure that especially low-income students don't have to borrow, especially for non-tuition costs. There are programs called free college or promise programs at the local level or state level in, in a number of states. Oftentimes, based on existing resources, those programs are limited to tuition costs and oftentimes limited to, to two-year colleges. Two-year colleges don't have a tuition problem, right? The students who attend those, 80% of their full cost of attendance are things like books and fees, uh, housing, transportation, childcare, um, and so they need more support. And so some of the models for state-federal partnerships also involve the covering tuition, not just at two-year colleges, but also four-year public colleges, as well as, in many cases, minority-serving institutions that include historically Black colleges, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges. Um, and then also making sure low-income students have some additional aid to help with those other costs so they don't have to rely on debt to finance those things. Um, and that involves doing things like doubling the Pell Grant so that it gets closer to covering at least half of the full cost of attendance for um, at a public four-year college or university. Something Jennifer, that's, uh, I, yeah, Tom. Jennifer, I would point out too, and, and in terms of the options, increasing the Pell, Pell program uh, is, is a key, doing incentives with the state, all those sorts of things. Those can all be financed in effect on a neutral basis by eliminating a lot of the programs that exist today. There are tax credits that go into education, all those sorts of things. Again, the target, to be truthful with you, higher income earners that don't need it. By eliminating those, you would put the money back to the people that and the, the students that really need it. You'd address those first time generation uh, college learners, the lower income, and you'd be able to finance that on a mutual basis. So by putting money into the Pell Grants, some of these incentives that we've talked about with the states, those sorts of things, and eliminating other programs, you can do it on a neutral basis. So again, it's a reallocation of resources as opposed to just putting additional resources into the game. And it makes a much more effective system. And just sounds like simplifying it. Uh, one area that I think a lot of people, it always catches them like, wait, what? Student loans, immensely hard to get rid of in bankruptcy. Uh, Tom, and I'd love to just start with you if you think we need some changes there um, and, and what you're hearing, just because it's, it's very hard to discharge that. And as we've seen since the financial crisis, uh, people are ending up with higher and higher burdens right now. Could that be a place uh, where we should look for changes as well? Uh, you, you very easily could do that. That would be on the table, I think, on, on both sides of the aisle, so, so to speak. I think the challenge that you have there in the issue is a lot of federal programs, uh, these loan programs as well as other, aren't part of the bankruptcy proceedings. So you might have to deal with it in a wider context, not only student loans, but some of the other issues that go into it. Uh, on the whole, uh, contributions from the taxpayer are not usually uh, pulled out of, out of bankruptcy. 
So I think you'd want to deal with it on federal programs across the, the board. But to those people that, that are in need, I think you certainly could address something like that. Tiffany, do you see any uh, major drawbacks about trying to change the way bankruptcy handles student loans? Well, it's actually something really important to do. Uh, and in fact, there were a law put in place that made it more difficult for students to uh, debt through bankruptcy. Um, and so that means that policy can be reversed as well and reconsidered um, in today's context. And just from conversations we've had doing research with borrowers who are really struggling and what their experiences are, this is really, really important because having this burden, again, it comes in the, it's impacting folks' life decisions, their personal decisions, the stress and anxiety that comes from having this debt. And to think about what type of condition you have to be in in terms of your financial situation situation for bankruptcy to be on the table and the fact that, again, other types of consumer debt um, can be discharged in this way that don't represent, uh, you know, the way that we're expected to finance getting access to higher ed, which often serves as a gatekeeper from being able to participate in today's economy. Um, I would argue that it's more important to be able to discharge higher ed debt than perhaps other types of consumer debt through bankruptcy. So we definitely got to change course. Uh, Tom, earlier you had brought up uh, private uh, and for-profit schools, and I, I, there's extensive litigation efforts right now regarding ITT Tech and the debt that their students owe the federal government. This is despite the school shutting down. And as we all know, you know, a lot of businesses are shutting down right now. We've got movie theaters going out of business. Airlines are uh, looking for uh, a bailout here. So this could be something that continues. Do you think that the current system works there in terms of managing school closure and debt? Um, is there something we need to do on that front? I think we can all agree it doesn't. Um, there, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, first of all, we can have the various companies, in, including public and private. Again, I think public and private should be treated the same way, profit and for-profit and, and non-profit in the same way. We can provide a lot better information to the Department of Education on a timely basis so they can address this. If you see the information that comes in from companies today, it's dated. It's very difficult to get your hand, hands around and be able to make any kind of predictive nature of that. That would be the first thing is information. Second, I think one thing that would help an awful lot is, as I said, there's an awful lot of federal money that's gone into it. And the institutions, to be truthful with you, haven't been accountable. One of the things that we can do is make those institutions accountable so that they're making these loans, they're starting to pay early on for outcomes that are poor, not graduating students, students not progressing, those sorts of things. Those companies should be accountable. I think we, 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 could, we could do that. Then there's other things that we could put behind it in terms of requiring letters of credit, requiring teach out plans today, which are at best um, indiscriminate and not very uh, not very well uh, uh, put put forward and require those from all of those institutions. As I said, I would require it from all institutions because I think over the course of the next couple of decades, you're going to see of the 40,000 institutions that today are focused on higher learning in our, in, our, um, in our country, you're probably going to see half of them that are going to go away for one reason or another. Wow, those are some big changes on the horizon. Uh, Tiffany, as we wrap up here, I, I'm just curious, given what we've gone through this year, how big this problem is uh, as we unpack it. If you are relatively hopeful that, I mean, Tom just said in the next couple decades, right? This is gonna go out a while, but hopeful in, let's say the next few years that we're gonna see meaningful change in this space. Absolutely, I think because uh, regardless of political affiliation, the constituents and the voters recognize that there's big problems in higher ed and affordability is one of them. And they're demanding that their elected officials figure out a plan to do something about it, which is why the popularity of things like free college, which you know was laughable, you know maybe five to ten years ago, has uh, support in red and blue states, um, right? Because it's important for pol all policymakers to have at least a plan for figuring out how they're going to invest in strengthening our higher education system and making it uh, more affordable. That gives me hope. I'm also very equally concerned because right now in this moment of crisis, there's already evidence that states have, you know, because of budget crises, having to walk back some of those commitments and examples of waiting lists of students who wanted to, you know, participate in higher education and are no longer able to access 
funds they thought would be there. And there's already data coming in that says, you know, students aren't filling out the FAFSA as much. They aren't enrolling in college in the same numbers, especially for black students and low income students, students who would benefit the most from the opportunity to uh, get a post-secondary degree or credential in terms of their, their expanded job opportunities once they graduate. Um, so those things are really concerning, but at the same time, um, I'm glad to see higher education rise to the top in terms of being a core issue that elected officials seem to be focused on and in hopeful that whomever is elected for whatever offices uh, in the upcoming elections that uh, it will remain a, a top issue um, to you know move forward. Mary, well, thank I, you I, both. I would, uh, Go I was just going to say, I, I would reinforce that there are some very thoughtful plans that have been put together that address some of these broad issues that don't just throw money into the wind. Bipartisan Policy Center put one forward that I think is very well thought out that addresses all the needs. I think it's also important as we talk about the problems and as we leave this, that we also need to have an optimistic view. Uh, the higher education system in the United States has been an enormous engine to grow our economy made us the strongest world, the uh, strongest country in, in the world. And it is truly a competitive advantage. It is something that's important. And I think we all agree that having students have an op option and accessibility to a higher education for their benefits, for their families becomes crucial. We, we, we can't leave that behind. A big thank you to both of you for talking us, to us about this issue. Uh, Tiffany Jones, uh, Tom Leppard, thank you both very much. And I'm gonna toss it right back to Mariette. Yes, thank you so much again, Tom, Tiffany, and Jennifer, and thank you to Yahoo Finance for helping us host this timely conversation. The student loan debt crisis predates the pandemic, but as the economic outlook remains uncertain, addressing student loan debt will be a priority for the next, must be a priority for the next administration. Earlier this year, as Tom mentioned, the Bipartisan Policy Center's Task Force on Higher Education Financing and Student Outcomes detailed a range of policy recommendations aimed at improving the federal student loan system, including a reform that would automatically enroll all borrowers onto an income-driven repayment plan to reduce default rates and promote more affordable monthly payments. You can find out more information about this report and the rest of our work at bipartisanpolicy.org. On behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center and Yahoo Finance, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll tune in next week for our final segment on savings and retirement.